Chapter Eighteen, Part Two of A Diary from Dixie. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Laurie Ann Walden. A Diary from Dixie by Mary Chestnut. Chapter Eighteen, Columbia, South Carolina, Part Two. August twenty ninth. I take my hospital duty in the morning. Most persons prefer afternoon, but I dislike to give up my pleasant evenings. So I get up at five o'clock and go down in my carriage, all laden with provisions. Mrs. Fisher and old Mr. Bryan generally go with me. Provisions are commonly sent by people to Mrs. Fisher's. I am so glad to be a hospital nurse once more. I had excuses enough, but at heart I felt a coward and a skulker. I think I know how men feel who hire a substitute and shirk the fight. There must be no dodging of duty. It will not do now to send provisions and pay for nurses. Something inside of me kept calling out, Go, you shabby creature, you can't bear to see what those fine fellows have to bear. Mrs. Izzard was staying with me last night, and as I slipped away I begged Molly to keep everything dead still and not let Mrs. Izzard be disturbed until I got home. About ten I drove up, and there was a row to wake the dead. Molly's eldest daughter, who nurses her baby sister, let the baby fall, and regardless of Mrs. Izzard, as I was away, Molly was giving the nurse a switching in the yard, accompanied by howls and yells worthy of a Comanche. The small nurse welcomed my advent, no doubt, for in two seconds peace was restored. Mrs. Izzard said she sympathized with the baby's mother, so I forgave the uproar. I have excellent servants, no matter for their shortcomings behind my back. They save me all thought as to household matters, and they are so kind, attentive, and quiet. They must know what is at hand if Sherman is not hindered from coming here. Freedom, my masters! But these sphinxes give no sign, unless it be increased diligence and absolute silence, as certain in their action and as noiseless as a law of nature, at any rate, when we are in the house. That fearful hospital haunts me all day long, and is worse at night. So much suffering, such loathsome wounds, such distortion— with stumps of limbs not half cured, exhibited to all. Then, when I was so tired yesterday, Molly was looking more like an enraged lioness than anything else, roaring that her baby's neck was broken and howling cries of vengeance. The poor little careless nurse's dark face had an ashen tinge of gray terror. She was crouching near the ground like an animal trying to hide, and her mother striking at her as she rolled away. All this was my welcome as I entered the gate. It takes these half-Africans but a moment to go back to their naked, savage, animal nature. Mrs. Izzard is a charming person. She tried so to make me forget it all and rest. September 2nd. The battle has been raging at Atlanta, and our fate hanging in the balance. Footnote. After the battle, Atlanta was taken possession of and partly burned by the Federals. End footnote. Atlanta, indeed, is gone. Well, that agony is over. Like David, when the child was dead, I will get up from my knees, will wash my face, and comb my hair. No hope. We will try to have no fear. At the Prestons I found them drawn up in line of battle every moment looking for the doctor on his way to Richmond. Now, to drown thought, for our day is done, read Dumas' maitre d'armes. Russia ought to sympathize with us. We are not as barbarous as this, even if Mrs. Stowe's word be taken. Brutal men with unlimited power are the same all over the world. See Russell's India, Bull Run Russell's. They say General Morgan has been killed. We are hard as stones. We sit unmoved and hear any bad news chance may bring. Are we stupefied? September 19th. My pink silk dress I have sold for six hundred dollars, to be paid for in installments, two hundred a month for three months. And I sell my eggs and butter from home for two hundred dollars a month. Does it not sound well, four hundred dollars a month regularly? But in what? In Confederate money. Eh la! September 21st. Went with Mrs. Rhett to hear Dr. Palmer. I did not know before how utterly hopeless was our situation. This man is so eloquent it was hard to listen and not give way. Despair was his word, and martyrdom. He offered us nothing more in this world than the martyr's crown. 
He is not for slavery, he says. He is for freedom, and the freedom to govern our own country as we see fit. He is against foreign interference in our state matters. That is what Mr. Palmer went to war for, it appears. Every day shows that slavery is doomed the world over. For that he thanked God. He spoke of our agony, and then came the cry, Help us, O God, vain is the help of man. And so we came away shaken to the depths. The end has come, no doubt of the fact. Our army has so moved as to uncover Macon and Augusta. We are going to be wiped off the face of the earth. What is there to prevent Sherman taking General Lee in the rear? We have but two armies, and Sherman is between them now. Footnote. During the summer and autumn of 1864, several important battles had occurred. In addition to the engagements by Sherman's army farther south, there had occurred in Virginia the Battle of Cold Harbor in the early part of June, those before Petersburg in the latter part of June and during July and August, the Battle of Winchester on September 19th during Sheridan's Shenandoah campaign, and the Battle of Cedar Creek on October 19th. End footnote. September 24th. These stories of our defeats in the valley fall like blows upon a dead body. Since Atlanta fell, I have felt as if all were dead within me forever. Captain Ogden, of General Chestnut's staff, dined here today. Had ever brigadier, with little or no brigade, so magnificent a staff? The reserves, as somebody said, have been secured only by robbing the cradle and the grave, the men too old, the boys too young. Isaac Hayne, Edward Barnwell, Bacon, Ogden, Richardson, Miles, are the picked men of the agreeable world. October 1st. Mary Canty Preston's wedding day has come and gone, and Mary is Mrs. John Darby now. Maggie Howell dressed the bride's hair beautifully, they said, but it was all covered by her veil, which was of blonde lace, and the dress tulle and blonde lace, with diamonds and pearls. The bride walked up the aisle on her father's arm, Mrs. Preston on Dr. Darby's. I think it was the handsomest wedding party I ever saw. John Darby had brought his wedding uniform home with him from England, and it did all honor to his perfect figure. I forget the name of his London tailor. The best, of course. Well, said Isabella, it would be hard for any man to live up to those clothes. Footnote. After the war, Dr. Darby became professor of surgery in the University of the City of New York. He had served as medical director in the Army of the Confederate States, and as professor of anatomy and surgery in the University of South Carolina, had also served with distinction in European wars. End footnote. And now, to the amazement of us all, Captain Chestnut, Johnny, who knows everything, has rushed into a flirtation with Buck such as never was. He drives her every day, and those wild, runaway, sorrel colts terrify my soul as they go tearing, pitching, and darting from side to side of the street. And my lady enjoys it. When he leaves her, he kisses her hand, bowing so low to do it unseen that we see it all. Saturday. The President will be with us here in Columbia next Tuesday, so Colonel McLean brings us word. I have begun at once to prepare to receive him in my small house. His apartments have been decorated as well as Confederate stringency would permit. The possibilities were not great, but I did what I could for our honored chief. Besides, I like the man. He has been so kind to me, and his wife is one of the few to whom I can never be grateful enough for her generous appreciation and attention. I went out to the gate to greet the President, who met me most cordially, kissed me, in fact. Custis Lee and Governor Lubbock were at his back. Immediately after breakfast, the presidential party arrived a little before daylight. General Chestnut drove off with the president's aides, and Mr. Davis sat out on our piazza. There was nobody with him but myself. Some little boys strolling by called out, "'Come here and look. There is a man on Mrs. Chestnut's porch who looks just like Jeff Davis on postage stamps.' People began to gather at once on the street. Mr. Davis then went in. Mrs. McCord sent a magnificent bouquet. I thought, of course, for the president, but she gave me such a scolding afterward. She did not know he was there. I, in my mistake about the bouquet, thought she knew, and so did not send her word. 
The President was watching me prepare a mint julep for Custis Lee when Colonel McLean came to inform us that a great crowd had gathered and that they were coming to ask the President to speak to them at one o'clock. An immense crowd it was, men, women, and children. The crowd overflowed the house. The President's hand was nearly shaken off. I went to the rear, my head intent on the dinner to be prepared for him, with only a Confederate commissariat. But the patriotic public had come to the rescue. I had been gathering what I could of eatables for a month, and now I found that nearly everybody in Columbia was sending me whatever they had that they thought nice enough for the President's dinner. We had the sixty-year-old Madeira from Mulberry, and the beautiful old China, etc. Mrs. Preston sent a boned turkey stuffed with truffles, stuffed tomatoes, and stuffed peppers. Each made a dish as pretty as it was appetizing. A mob of small boys only came to pay their respects to the President. He seemed to know how to meet that odd delegation. Then the President's party had to go, and we bade them an affectionate farewell. Custis Lee and I had spent much time gossiping on the back porch. While I was concocting dainties for the dessert, he sat on the banister with his cigar in his mouth. He spoke very candidly, telling me many a hard truth for the Confederacy, and about the bad time which was at hand. October 18th. Ten pleasant days I owe to my sister. Kate has descended upon me unexpectedly from the mountains of Flat Rock. We are true sisters. She understands me without words. And she is the cleverest, sweetest woman I know, so graceful and gracious in manner, so good and unselfish in character. But best of all, she is so agreeable. Any time or place would be charming with Kate for a companion. General Chestnut was in Camden, but I could not wait. I gave the beautiful bride, Mrs. Darby, a dinner, which was simply perfection. I was satisfied for once in my life with my own table, and I know pleasanter guests were never seated around any table whatsoever. My house is always crowded. After all, what a number of pleasant people we have been thrown in with by war's catastrophes. I call such society glorious. It is the wind-up, but the old life, as it begins to die, will die royally. General Chestnut came back disheartened. He complains that such a life as I lead gives him no time to think. October 28th. Burton Harrison writes to General Preston that supreme anxiety reigns in Richmond. Oh, for one single port! If the Alabama had had in the whole wide world a port to take her prizes to and where she could be refitted, I believe she would have borne us through. Oh, for one single port by which we could get at the outside world and refit our whole Confederacy! If we could have hired regiments from Europe, or even have imported ammunition and food for our soldiers! Some days must be dark and dreary. At the Mantua Makers, however, I saw an instance of faith in our future, a bride's paraphernalia, and the radiant bride herself, the bridegroom expectant and elect now within twenty miles of Chattanooga, and outward bound to face the foe. Saw at the Lawrences not only Lizzie Hamilton, a perfect little beauty, but the very table the first Declaration of Independence was written upon. These Lawrences are grandchildren of Henry Lawrence of the First Revolution. Alas, we have yet to make good our second Declaration of Independence, Southern Independence, from Yankee meddling and Yankee rule. Hood has written to ask them to send General Chesnut out to command one of his brigades. In whose place? If Albert Sidney Johnston had lived, poor old General Lee has no backing. Stonewall would have saved us from Antietam. Sherman will now catch General Lee by the rear, while Grant holds him by the head, and while Hood and Thomas are performing an Indian war dance on the frontier. Hood means to cut his way to Lee, see if he doesn't. The Yanks have had a struggle for it. More than once we seem to have been too much for them. We have been so near to success, it aches one to think of it. So runs the table talk. Next to our house, which Isabella calls Tilly Tudlam, since Mr. Davis's visit, is a common of green grass and very level, beyond which comes a belt of pine trees. On this open space, within forty paces of us, a regiment of foreign deserters has camped. They have taken the oath of allegiance to our government, and are now being drilled and disciplined into form before being sent to our army. They are mostly Germans, with some Irish, however. Their close proximity keeps me miserable. 
Traitors once, traitors forever. Jordan has always been held responsible for all the foolish proclamations, and indeed for whatever Beauregard reported or proclaimed. Now he has left that mighty chief, and lo, here comes from Beauregard the silliest and most boastful of his military bulletins. He brags of Shiloh. That was not the way the story was told to us. A letter from Mrs. Davis, who says, Thank you a thousand times, my dear friend, for your more than maternal kindness to my dear child. That is what she calls her sister, Maggie Howell. As to Mr. Davis, he thinks the best ham, the best Madeira, the best coffee, the best hostess in the world, rendered Columbia delightful to him when he passed through. We are in a sad and anxious state here just now. The dead come in, but the living do not go out so fast. However, we hope all things, and trust in God as the only one able to resolve the opposite state of feeling into a triumphant, happy whole. I had a surprise of an unusually gratifying nature a few days since. I found I could not keep my horses, so I sold them. The next day they were returned to me with a handsome, anonymous note to the effect that they had been bought by a few friends for me. But I fear I cannot feed them. Strictly between us, things look very anxious here. November 6th. Sally Hampton went to Richmond with the Reverend Mr. Martin. She arrived there on Wednesday. On Thursday, her father, Wade Hampton, fought a great battle, but just did not win it, a victory narrowly missed. Darkness supervened, and impenetrable woods prevented that longed-for consummation. Preston Hampton rode recklessly into the hottest fire. His father sent his brother, Wade, to bring him back. Wade saw him reel in the saddle and galloped up to him, General Hampton following. As young Wade reached him, Preston fell from his horse, and the one brother, stooping to raise the other, was himself shot down. Preston recognized his father, but died without speaking a word. Young Wade, though wounded, held his brother's head up. Tom Taylor and others hurried up. The general took his dead son in his arms, kissed him, and handed his body to Tom Taylor and his friends, bade them take care of Wade, and then rode back to his post. At the head of his troops in the thickest of the fray, he directed the fight for the rest of the day. Until night he did not know young Wade's fate. That boy might be dead, too. Now, he says, no son of his must be in his command. When Wade recovers, he must join some other division. The agony of such a day, and the anxiety and the duties of the battlefield, it is all more than a mere man can bear. Another letter from Mrs. Davis. She says, I was dreadfully shocked at Preston Hampton's fate, his untimely fate. I know nothing more touching in history than General Hampton's situation at the supremest moment of his misery, when he sent one son to save the other, and saw both fall and could not know for some moments whether both were not killed. A thousand dollars have slipped through my fingers already this week. At the commissaries I spent five hundred today for candles, sugar, and a lamp, etc. Tallow candles are bad enough, but of them there seems to be an end, too. Now we are restricted to smoky terrabine lamps. Terrabine is a preparation of turpentine. When the chimney of the lamp cracks, as crack it will, we plaster up the piece with paper, thick old letter paper, preferring the highly glazed kind. In the hunt for paper, queer old letters come to light. Sherman, in Atlanta, has left Thomas to take care of Hood. Hood has 30,000 men, Thomas 40,000, and as many more to be had as he wants. He has only to ring the bell and call for them. Grant can get all that he wants, both for himself and for Thomas. All the world is open to them, while we are shut up in a Bastille. We are at sea, and our boat has sprung a leak. November 17th. Although Sherman took Atlanta, he does not mean to stay there, be it heaven or hell. Footnote. General Sherman had started from Chattanooga for his march across Georgia on May 6, 1864. He had won the battles of Dalton, Resaca, and New Hope Church in May, the Battle of Kennesaw Mountain in June the battles of Peachtree Creek and Atlanta in July, and had formally occupied Atlanta on September 2nd. On November 16th, he started his march from Atlanta to the sea and entered Savannah on December 23rd. 
Early in 1865 he moved his army northward through the Carolinas, and on April 26 received the surrender of General Joseph E. Johnston. End footnote. Fire and the sword are for us here. That is the word. And now I must begin my Columbia life anew and alone. It will be a short shrift. Captain Ogden came to dinner on Sunday, and in the afternoon asked me to go with him to the Presbyterian Church and hear Mr. Palmer. We went, and I felt very youthful, as the country people say, like a girl and her beau. Ogden took me into a pew, and my husband sat afar off. What a sermon! The preacher stirred my blood. My very flesh crept and tingled. A red-hot glow of patriotism passed through me. Such a sermon must strengthen the hearts and the hands of many people. There was more exhortation to fight and die, a la Joshua, than meek Christianity. End of chapter 18, part 2《Part Three of A Diary from Dixie. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Laurie Ann Walden. A Diary from Dixie by Mary Chestnut. Chapter 18, Columbia, South Carolina, Part Three. November 25th. Sherman is thundering at Augusta's very doors. My general was on the wing, somber and full of care. The girls are merry enough. The staff, who fairly live here, know better. Cassandra, with a black shawl over her head, is chased by the gay crew from sofa to sofa, for she avoids them, being full of miserable anxiety. There is nothing but distraction and confusion. All things tend to the preparation for the departure of the troops. It rains all the time. Such rains as I never saw before. Incessant torrents. These men come in and out in the red mud and slush of Columbia streets. Things seem dismal and wretched to me to the last degree but the staff, the girls, and the youngsters do not see it. Mrs. S., born in Connecticut, came, and she was radiant. She did not come to see me, but my nieces. She says exultingly that, Sherman will open a way out at last, and I will go at once to Europe, or go north to my relatives there. How she derided our misery and mocked when our fear cometh. I dare say she takes me for a fool. I sat there dumb, although she was in my own house. I have heard of a woman so enraged that she struck someone over the head with a shovel. Today, for the first time in my life, I know how that mad woman felt. I could have given Mrs. S. the benefit of shovel and tongs both. That splendid fellow, Preston Hampton, home they brought their warrior, dead, and wrapped in that very legion flag he had borne so often in battle with his own hands. A letter from Mrs. Davis today, under date of Richmond, Virginia, November 20, 1864. She says, Affairs West are looking so critical now that, before you receive this, you and I will be in the depths, or else triumphant. I confess I do not sniff success in every passing breeze, but I am so tired, hoping, fearing, and being disappointed, that I have made up my mind not to be disconsolate, even though thieves break through and steal. Some people expect another attack upon Richmond shortly, but I think the avalanche will not slide until the spring breaks up its winter quarters. I have a blind kind of prognostics of victory for us, but somehow I am not cheered. The temper of Congress is less vicious, but more concerted in its hostile action. Mrs. Davis is a woman that my heart aches for in the troubles ahead. My journal, a choir of Confederate paper, lies wide open on my desk in the corner of my drawing-room. Everybody reads it who chooses. Buck comes regularly to see what I have written last, and makes faces when it does not suit her. Isabella still calls me Cassandra, and puts her hands to her ears when I begin to wail. Well, Cassandra only records what she hears. She does not vouch for it. For really, one nowadays never feels certain of anything. November 28th. We dined at Mrs. McCord's. She is as strong a cordial for broken spirits and failing heart as one could wish. How her strength contrasts with our weakness. Like Dr. Palmer, she strings one up to bear bravely the worst. She has the intellect of a man and the perseverance and endurance of a woman. We have lost nearly all of our men, and we have no money, and it looks as if we had taught the Yankees how to fight since Manassas. 
Our best and bravest are under the sod. We shall have to wait till another generation grows up. Here we stand, despair in our hearts. Oh, Cassandra, don't, shouts Isabella. With our houses burning, or about to be, over our heads. The North have just got things shipshape. A splendid army, perfectly disciplined, with new levies coming in day and night. Their gentry do not go into the ranks. They hardly know there is a war up there. December 1st. At Kusawachi, Yankees are landing in great force. Our troops down there are raw militia, old men and boys never under fire before, some college cadets, in all a mere handful. The cradle and the grave have been robbed by us, they say. Sherman goes to Savannah and not to Augusta. December 2nd. Isabella and I put on bonnets and shawls and went deliberately out for news. We determined to seek until we found. Met a man who was so ugly I could not forget him or his sobriquet. He was awfully in love with me once. He did not know me, but blushed hotly when Isabella told him who I was. He had forgotten me, I hope, or else I am changed by age and care past all recognition. He gave us the encouraging information that Gramville had been burned to the ground. When the call for horses was made, Mrs. McCord sent in her fine bays. She comes now with a pair of mules, and looks too long and significantly at my ponies. If I were not so much afraid of her, I would hint that those mules would be of far more use in camp than my ponies. But they will seize the ponies, no doubt. In all my life before, the stables were far off from the house, and I had nothing to do with them. Now my ponies are kept under an open shed next to the back piazza. Here I sit with my work, or my desk, or my book, basking in our southern sun, and I watch Nat feed, curry, and rub down the horses, and then he cleans their stables as thoroughly as Smith does my drawing-room. I see their beds of straw comfortably laid. Nat says, Oh, missus, ain't ladies' business to look so much into stables. I care nothing for his grumbling, and I have never had horses in better condition. Poor ponies, you deserve every attention, and enough to eat. Grass does not grow under your feet. By night and day you are on the trot. Today General Chestnut was in Charleston on his way from Augusta to Savannah by rail. The telegraph is still working between Charleston and Savannah. Gramville certainly is burned. There was fighting down there today. I came home with enough to think about, heaven knows. And then, all day long, we compounded a pound cake in honor of Mrs. Cuthbert, who has things so nice at home. The cake was a success, but was it worth all that trouble? As my party were driving off to the concert, an omnibus rattled up. Enter Captain Leland, of General Chestnut's staff, of as imposing a presence as a field marshal, handsome and gray-haired. He was here on some military errand and brought me a letter. He said the Yankees had been repulsed, and that down in those swamps we could give a good account of ourselves if our government would send men enough. With a sufficient army to meet them down there, they could be annihilated. "'Where are the men to come from?' asked Mamie, wildly. "'General Hood has gone off to Tennessee. Even if he does defeat Thomas there, what difference would that make here?' December 3rd. We drank tea at Mrs. McCord's. She had her troubles, too. The night before, a country cousin claimed her hospitality, one who fain would take the train at five this morning. A little after midnight, Mrs. McCord was startled out of her first sleep by a loud ringing of bells. An alarm at night may mean so much just now. In an instant she was on her feet. She found her guest, who thought it was daylight and wanted to go. Mrs. McCord forcibly demonstrated how foolish it was to get up five hours too soon. Mrs. McCord, once more in her own warm bed, had fallen happily to sleep. She was waked by feeling two ice-cold hands pass cautiously over her face and person. It was pitch dark. Even Mrs. McCord gave a scream in her fright. She found it was only the irrepressible guest up and at her again. So, though it was only three o'clock, in order to quiet this perturbed spirit, she rose, and at five drove her to the station, where she had to wait some hours. But Mrs. McCord said, Anything for peace at home. The restless people who will not let others rest. December 5th. Miss Olivia Middleton and Mr. Frederick Blake are to be married. We Confederates have invented the sit-up all night for the wedding night. Isabella calls it the wake, not the wedding, of the parties married. 
The ceremony will be performed early in the evening. The whole company will then sit up until five o'clock, at which hour the bridal couple take the train for Combahee. Hope Sherman will not be so inconsiderate as to cut short the honeymoon. In tripped Brewster, with his hat on his head, both hands extended, and his greeting, "'Well, here we are!' He was travel-stained, disheveled, grimy with dirt. The prophet would have to send him many times to bathe in Jordan before he could be pronounced clean." Hood will not turn and pursue Sherman. Thomas is at his heels with forty thousand men, and can have as many more as he wants for the asking. Between Thomas and Sherman, Hood would be crushed. So he was pushing. I do not remember where or what. I know there was no comfort in anything he said. Serena's account of money spent. Paper and envelopes, twelve dollars. Tickets to concert, ten dollars. Toothbrush, ten dollars. Total, thirty-two dollars. December 14th. And now the young ones are in bed, and I am wide awake. It is an odd thing. In all my life, how many persons have I seen in love? Not a half dozen. And I am a tolerably close observer. A faithful watcher have I been from my youth upward of men and manners. Society has been for me only an enlarged field for character study. Flirtation is the business of society, that is, playing at love-making. It begins in vanity, it ends in vanity. It is spurred on by idleness and a want of any other excitement. Flattery, battledore and shuttlecock, how in this game flattery is dashed backward and forward. It is so soothing to self-conceit. If it begins and ends in vanity, vexation of spirit supervenes sometimes. They do occasionally burn their fingers awfully, playing with fire. But there are no hearts broken. Each party in a flirtation has secured a sympathetic listener to whom he or she can talk of himself or herself, somebody who, for the time, admires one exclusively, and, as the French say, excessivement. It is a pleasant but very foolish game, and so to bed. Hood and Thomas have had a fearful fight, with carnage and loss of generals excessive in proportion to numbers. That means they were leading and urging their men up to the enemy. I know how Bartow and Barnard B. were killed bringing up their men. One of Mr. Chestnut's sins, thrown in his teeth by the legislature of South Carolina, was that he procured the promotion of gist, states' rights gist, by his influence in Richmond. What have these comfortable, stay-at-home patriots to say of General Gist now? And how could man die better than facing fearful odds? Etc. So Fort McAllister has fallen. Goodbye, Savannah. Our governor announces himself a follower of Joe Brown, of Georgia. Another famous Joe. December 19th. The deep waters are closing over us, and we are in this house like the outsiders at the time of the flood. We care for none of these things. We eat, drink, laugh, dance, and lightness of heart. Dr. Trezevant came to tell me the dismal news. How he piled on the agony. Desolation, mismanagement, despair. General Young, with the flower of Hampton's cavalry, is in Columbia. Horses cannot be found to mount them. Neither the governor of Georgia nor the governor of South Carolina is moving hand or foot. They have given up. The Yankees claim another victory for Thomas. Footnote. Reference is here made to the battle between Hood and Thomas at Nashville, the result of which was the breaking up of Hood's army as a fighting force. End footnote. Hope it may prove, like most of their victories, brag and bluster. Can't say why. Maybe I am benumbed, but I do not feel so intensely miserable. December 27th. Oh, why did we go to Camden? The very dismalest Christmas overtook us there. Miss Rhett went with us, a brilliant woman and very agreeable. The world, you know, is composed, said she, of men, women, and Rhetts. See, Lady Montague. Now we feel that if we are to lose our Negroes, we would as soon see Sherman free them as the Confederate government. Freeing Negroes is the last Confederate government craze. We are a little too slow about it, that is all. Sold fifteen bales of cotton and took a sad farewell look at Mulberry. It is a magnificent old country seat, with old oaks, green lawns, and all. So I took that last farewell of Mulberry, once so hated, now so beloved. January 7th. Sherman is at Hardyville and Hood in Tennessee, 
the last of his men not gone, as Louis Wigfall so cheerfully prophesied. Serena went for a half hour today to the dentist. Her teeth are of the whitest and most regular, simply perfection. She fancied it was better to have a dentist look in her mouth before returning to the mountains. For that look she paid three hundred and fifty dollars in Confederate money. "'Why, has this money any value at all?' she asked. "'Little enough, in all truth, sad to say. "'Brewster was here and stayed till midnight. "'Said he must see General Chestnut. "'He had business with him. "'His, me, and General Hood is no longer comic. "'He described Sherman's march of destruction and desolation. "'Sherman leaves a track fifty miles wide "'upon which there is no living thing to be seen,' "'said Brewster before he departed. "'January 10th. You do the Anabasis business when you want to get out of the enemy's country, and the Thermopylae business when they want to get into your country. But we retreated in our own country, and we gave up our mountain passes without a blow. But never mind the Greeks. If we had only our own gamecock Sumter, our own swamp fox Marion. Marion's men or Sumter's, or the equivalent of them, now lie under the sod in Virginia or Tennessee. January 14th. Yesterday I broke down, gave way to abject terror under the news of Sherman's advance, with no news of my husband. Today, while wrapped up on the sofa, too dismal even for moaning, there was a loud knock. Shawl's own and all, just as I was, I rushed to the door to find a telegram from my husband. All well, be at home Tuesday. It was dated from Adam's Run. I felt as light-hearted as if the war were over. Then I looked at the date and the place. Adam's Run. It ends as it began, in a run. Bull's Run, from which their first sprightly running astounded the world, and now Adam's Run. But if we must run, who are left to run? From Bull Run they ran full-handed, but we have fought until maimed soldiers, women, and children are all that remain to run. Today Kershaw's brigade, or what is left of it, passed through. What shouts greeted it, and what bold shouts of thanks it returned! It was all a very encouraging noise, absolutely comforting. Some true men are left, after all. January 16th. My husband is at home once more, for how long I do not know. His aides fill the house, and a group of hopelessly wounded haunt the place. The drilling and the marching go on outside. It rains a flood, with freshet after freshet. The forces of nature are befriending us, for our enemies have to make their way through swamps. A month ago my husband wrote me a letter which I promptly suppressed, after showing it to Mrs. McCord. He warned us to make ready, for the end had come. Our resources were exhausted, and the means of resistance could not be found. We could not bring ourselves to believe it, and now, he thinks, with the railroad all blown up, the swamps made impassable by the freshets, which have no time to subside, so constant is the rain, and the negroes utterly apathetic. Would they be so if they saw us triumphant? If we had but an army to seize the opportunity, we might do something, but there are no troops. That is the real trouble. Today Mrs. McCord exchanged sixteen thousand dollars in Confederate bills for three hundred dollars in gold. Sixteen thousand for three hundred. January 17th. The bazaar for the benefit of the hospitals opens now. Sherman marches constantly. All the railroads are smashed. And if I laugh at any mortal thing, it is that I may not weep. Generals are as plenty as blackberries, but none are in command. The Peace Commissioner, Blair, came. They say he gave Mr. Davis the kiss of peace. And we send Stevens, Campbell, all who have believed in this thing, to negotiate for peace. No hope, no good. Who dares hope? Repressed excitement in church. A great railroad character was called out. He soon returned and whispered something to Joe Johnston, and they went out together. Somehow the whisper moved around to us that Sherman was at Branchville. "'Grant us patience, good Lord,' was prayed aloud. "'Not Ulysses, Grant, good Lord,' murmured Teddy profanely. Hood came yesterday. He is staying at the Prestons with Jack. They sent for us. What a heartfelt greeting he gave us.' He can stand well enough without his crutch, but he does very slow walking. How plainly he spoke out dreadful words about my defeat and discomfiture, my army destroyed, my losses, etc., etc. 
He said he had nobody to blame but himself. A telegram from Beauregard today to my husband. He does not know whether Sherman intends to advance on Branchville, Charleston, or Columbia. Isabella said, Maybe you attempted the impossible, and began one of her merriest stories. Jack Preston touched me on the arm, and we slipped out. He did not hear a word she was saying. He has forgotten us all. Did you notice how he stared in the fire, and the lurid spots which came out on his face, and the drops of perspiration that stood on his forehead? Yes, he is going over some bitter scene. He sees Willie Preston with his heart shot away. He sees the panic at Nashville, and the dead on the battlefield at Franklin. That agony on his face comes again and again, said tender-hearted Jack. I can't keep him out of those absent fits. Governor McGrath and General Winder talk of preparations for a defense of Columbia. If Beauregard can't stop Sherman down there, what have we got here to do it with? Can we check or impede his march? Can anyone? Last night General Hampton came in. I am sure he would do something to save us if he were put in supreme command here. Hampton says Joe Johnston is equal, if not superior, to Lee as a commanding officer. My silver is in a box, and has been delivered for safekeeping to Isaac McLaughlin, who is really my beau ideal of a grateful negro. I mean to trust him. My husband cares for none of these things now, and lets me do as I please. Tom Archer died almost as soon as he got to Richmond. Prison takes the life out of men. He was only half alive when here. He had a strange, pallid look, and such a vacant stare until you roused him. Poor, pretty Sally Archer, that is the end of you. Footnote. Under last date entry, January 17th, the author chronicles events of later occurrence. It was her not infrequent custom to jot down happenings in dateless lines or paragraphs. Mr. Blair visited President Davis January 12th. Stevens, Hunter, and Campbell were appointed peace commissioners January 28th. End footnote. End of chapter 18, part 3. Part One of A Diary from Dixie. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Laurie Ann Walden. A Diary from Dixie by Mary Chestnut. Chapter Nineteen. Lincolnton, North Carolina, February sixteenth, eighteen sixty-five to March fifteenth, eighteen sixty-five. Part One. Lincolnton, North Carolina, February sixteenth, eighteen sixty-five. A change has come o'er the spirit of my dream. Dear old choir of yellow, coarse, confederate homemade paper, here you are again. An age of anxiety and suffering has passed over my head since last I wrote and wept over your forlorn pages. My ideas of those last days are confused. The Martins left Columbia the Friday before I did, and Mammy, the negro woman who had nursed them, refused to go with them. That daunted me. Then Mrs. McCord, who was to send her girls with me, changed her mind. She sent them upstairs in her house, and actually took away the staircase. That was her plan. Then I met Mr. Christopher Hampton, arranging to take off his sisters. They were flitting, but were to go only as far as Yorkville. He said it was time to move on. Sherman was at Orangeburg, barely a day's journey from Columbia, and had left a track as bare and blackened as a fire leaves on the prairies. So my time had come, too. My husband urged me to go home. He said Camden would be safe enough. They had no spite against that old town, as they have against Charleston and Columbia. Molly, weeping and wailing, came in while we were at table. Wiping her red-hot face with the cook's grimy apron, she said I ought to go among our own black people on the plantation. They would take care of me better than anyone else. So I agreed to go to Mulberry, or the Hermitage Plantation, and sent Lawrence down with a wagon-load of my valuables. Then a Miss Patterson called, a refugee from Tennessee. She had been in a country overrun by Yankee invaders, and she described so graphically all the horrors to be endured by those subjected to fire and sword, rapine and plunder, that I was fairly scared, and determined to come here. This is a thoroughly out-of-all-roots place. And yet I can go to Charlotte, am halfway to Kate at Flat Rock, and there is no Federal army between me and Richmond. As soon as my mind was finally made up, we telegraphed to Lawrence, who had barely got to Camden in the wagon when the telegram was handed to him, so he took the train and came back. Mr. Chestnut sent him with us to take care of the party. 
We thought that if the Negroes were ever so loyal to us, they could not protect me from an army bent upon sweeping us from the face of the earth. And if they tried to do so, so much the worse would it be for the poor things with their Yankee friends. I then left them to shift for themselves, as they are accustomed to do, and I took the same liberty. My husband does not care a fig for the property question, and never did. Perhaps if he had ever known poverty, it would be different. He talked beautifully about it, as he always does about everything. I have told him often that, if at Heaven's Gate St. Peter would listen to him a while, and let him tell his own story, he would get in, and the angels might give him a crown extra. Now he says he has only one care, that I should be safe, and not so harassed with dread. And then there is his blind old father. A man, said he, can always die like a patriot and a gentleman, with no fuss, and take it coolly. It is hard not to envy those who are out of all this, their difficulties ended, those who have met death gloriously on the battlefield, their doubts all solved. One can but do his best, and leave the result to a higher power. After New Orleans, those vain, passionate, impatient little creoles were forever committing suicide, driven to it by despair and beast butler. As we read these things, Mrs. Davis said, If they want to die, why not first kill Beast Butler, rid the world of their foe, and be saved the trouble of murdering themselves? That practical way of removing their intolerable burden did not occur to them. I repeated this suggestive anecdote to our corps of generals without troops here in the house, as they spread out their maps on my table where lay this choir of paper from which I write. Every man jack of them had a safe plan to stop Sherman, if... Even Beauregard and Lee were expected, but Grant had double-teamed on Lee. Lee could not save his own. How could he come to save us? Read the list of the dead in those last battles around Richmond and Petersburg, if you want to break your heart. Footnote. Battles at Hatchin's Run in Virginia had been fought on February 5, 6, and 7, 1865. End footnote. I took French leave of Columbia, slipped away without a word to anybody. Isaac Hayne and Mr. Chestnut came down to the Charlotte Depot with me. Ellen, my maid, left her husband and only child, but she was willing to come, and indeed was very cheerful in her way of looking at it. I won't travel round with Mrs. some time, stead of Molly going all the time. A woman, fifty years old at least, and uglier than she was old, sharply rebuked my husband for standing at the car window for a last few words with me. She said rudely, "'Stand aside, sir. I won't err.' With his hat off and his grand air, my husband bowed politely and said, "'In one moment, madam, I have something important to say to my wife.' She talked aloud and introduced herself to every man, claiming his protection. She had never traveled alone before in all her life. Old age and ugliness are protective in some cases. She was ardently patriotic for a while. Then she was joined by her friend, a man as crazy as herself, to get out of this. From their talk I gleaned she had been for years in the Treasury Department. They were about to cross the lines. The whole idea was to get away from the trouble to come down here. They were Yankees, but were they not spies? Here I am, broken-hearted and an exile. And in such a place! We have bare floors, and for a feather bed, pine table, and two chairs, I pay thirty dollars a day. Such sheets! But fortunately I have some of my own. At the door, before I was well out of the hack, the woman of the house packed Lawrence back, neck and heels. She would not have him at any price. She treated him as Mr. F.'s aunt did Clinman in Little Dorrit. She said his clothes were too fine for a nigger. His heirs, indeed! Poor Lawrence was humble and silent. He said at last, "'Miss Mary, send me back to Mars Jeems.' I began to look for a pencil to write a note to my husband, but in the flurry could not find one. "'Here is one,' said Lawrence, producing one with a gold case. "'Go away,' she shouted. "'I want no niggers here with gold pencils and airs.' So Lawrence fled before the storm, but not before he had begged me to go back. He said, if Mars Jeems knew how you was treated, he'd never be willin' for you to stay here. The Martins had seen my, to them, well-known traveling case as the hack trotted up Main Street, 
and they arrived at this juncture out of breath. We embraced and wept. I kept my room. The Fants are refugees here, too. They are Virginians, and have been in exile since the Second Battle of Manassas. Poor things, they seem to have been everywhere, and seen and suffered everything. They even tried to go back to their own house, but found one chimney only standing alone. Even that had been taken possession of by a Yankee, who had written his name upon it. The day I left home I had packed a box of flour, sugar, rice, and coffee, but my husband would not let me bring it. He said I was coming to a land of plenty, unexplored North Carolina, where the foot of the Yankee marauder was unknown, and in Columbia they would need food. Now I have written for that box and many other things to be sent me by Lawrence, or I shall starve. The Middletons have come. How joyously I sprang to my feet to greet them. Mrs. Ben Rutledge described the hubbub in Columbia. Everybody was flying in every direction like a flock of swallows. She heard the enemy's guns booming in the distance. The train no longer runs from Charlotte to Columbia. Miss Middleton possesses her soul in peace. She is as cool, clever, rational, and entertaining as ever, and we talked for hours. Mrs. Reed was in a state of despair. I can well understand that sinking of mind and body during the first days as the abject misery of it all closes in upon you. I remember my suicidal tendencies when I first came here. February 18th. Here I am, thank God, settled at the McLean's, in a clean, comfortable room, airy and cozy. With a grateful heart, I stir up my own bright wood fire. My bill for four days at this splendid hotel here was $240, with $25 additional for fire. But once more, my lines have fallen in pleasant places. As we came up on the train from Charlotte, a soldier took out of his pocket a filthy rag. If it had lain in the gutter for months, it could not have looked worse. He unwrapped the thing carefully and took out two biscuits of the species known as hardtack. Then he gallantly handed me one and with an ingratiating smile asked me to take some. Then he explained, saying, Please take these two, swap with me. Give me something softer that I can eat. I am very weak still. Immediately, for his benefit, my basket of luncheon was emptied. But as for his biscuit, I would not choose any. Isabella asked, But what did you say to him when he poked them under your nose? And I replied, I held up both hands, saying, I would not take from you anything that is yours, far from it. I would not touch them for worlds. A tremendous day's work, and I helped with a will. Our window glass was all to be washed. Then the brass andirons were to be polished. After we rubbed them bright, how pretty they were. Presently Ellen would have none of me. She was scrubbing the floor. You go, that's a good missus, and stay to Miss Isabella's till de floor dry. I am very docile now, and I obeyed orders. February 19th. The fans say all the trouble at the hotel came from our servants bragging. They represented us as millionaires, and the Middleton men servants smoked cigars. Mrs. Reeds averred that he had never done anything in his life but stand behind his master at table with a silver waiter in his hand. We were charged accordingly, but perhaps the landlady did not get the best of us after all, for we paid her in Confederate money. Now that they won't take Confederate money in the shops here, how are we to live? Miss Middleton says quartermaster's families are all clad in good gray cloth, but the soldiers go naked. Well, we are like the families of whom the novels always say they are poor but honest. Poor? Well, nigh beggars are we, for I do not know where my next meal is to come from. Called on Mrs. Ben Rutledge today. She is lovely, exquisitely refined. Her mother, Mrs. Middleton, came in. You are not looking well, dear. Anything the matter? No, but, Mama, I have not eaten a mouthful today. The children can eat mush. I can't. I drank my tea, however. She does not understand taking favors, and, blushing violently, refused to let me have Ellen make her some biscuit. I went home and sent her some biscuit, all the same. February 22nd. Isabella has been reading my diaries. How we laugh, because my sage divinations all come to naught. My famous insight into character is utter folly. 
The diaries were lying on the hearth ready to be burned, but she told me to hold on to them, think of them a while, and don't be rash. Afterward, when Isabella and I were taking a walk, General Joseph E. Johnston joined us. He explained to us all of Lee's and Stonewall Jackson's mistakes. We had nothing to say. How could we say anything? He said he was very angry when he was ordered to take command again. He might well have been in a genuine rage. This on-and-off procedure would be enough to bewilder the coolest head. Mrs. Johnston knows how to be a partisan of Joe Johnston and still not make his enemies uncomfortable. She can be pleasant and agreeable, as she was to my face. A letter from my husband, who is at Charlotte. He came near being taken a prisoner in Columbia, for he was asleep the morning of the 17th, when the Yankees blew up the railroad depot. That woke him, of course, and he found everybody had left Columbia, and the town was surrendered by the mayor, Colonel Goodwin. Hampton and his command had been gone several hours. Isaac Hayne came away with General Chestnut. There was no fire in the town when they left. They overtook Hampton's command at Meek's Mill. That night, from the hills where they encamped, they saw the fire, and knew the Yankees were burning the town, as we had every reason to expect they would. Molly was left in charge of everything of mine, including Mrs. Preston's cow, which I was keeping, and Sally Goodwin's furniture. Charleston and Wilmington have surrendered. I have no further use for a newspaper. I never want to see another one as long as I live. Wade Hampton has been made a lieutenant general, too late. If he had been made one and given command in South Carolina six months ago, I believe he would have saved us. Shame, disgrace, beggary, all have come at once and are hard to bear. The grand smash. Rain, rain outside, and naught but drowning floods of tears inside. I could not bear it, so I rushed down in that rainstorm to the Martins. Reverend Mr. Martin met me at the door. Madam, said he, Columbia is burned to the ground. I bowed my head and sobbed aloud. Stop that, he said, trying to speak cheerfully. Come here, wife, said he to Mrs. Martin. This woman cries with her whole heart, just as she laughs. But in spite of his words, his voice broke down, and he was hardly calmer than myself. February 23rd. I want to get to Kate. I am so utterly heartbroken. I hope John Chestnut and General Chestnut may at least get into the same army. We seem scattered over the face of the earth. Isabella sits there calmly reading. I have quieted down after the day's rampage. May our Heavenly Father look down on us and have pity. They say I was the last refugee from Columbia who was allowed to enter by the door of the cars. The government took possession then, and women could only be smuggled in by the windows. Stout ones stuck and had to be pushed, pulled, and hauled in by main force. Dear Mrs. Izzard, with all her dignity, was subjected to this rough treatment. She was found almost too much for the size of the car windows. February 25th. The Pfeiffers, who live opposite us here, are descendants of those Pfeiffers who came south with Mr. Chestnut's ancestors after the Fort Duquesne disaster. They have now, therefore, been driven out of their Eden, the Valley of Virginia, a second time. The present Pfeiffer is the great man, the rich man, par excellence, of Lincolnton. They say that, with something very near to tears in his eyes, he heard of our latest defeats. It is only a question of time with us now, he said. The raiders will come, you know. In Washington, before I knew any of them except by sight, Mrs. Davis, Mrs. Emory, and Mrs. Johnston were always together, inseparable friends, and the trio were pointed out to me as the cleverest women in the United States. Now that I do know them all well, I think the world was right in its estimate of them. Met a Mr. Ancrum of serenely cheerful aspect, happy and hopeful. All right now said he. Sherman sure to be thrashed. Joe Johnston is in command. Dr. Darby says, when the oft-mentioned Joseph, the malcontent, gave up his command to Hood, he remarked with a smile, I hope you will be able to stop Sherman. It was more than I could do. General Johnston is not of Mr. Ancrum's way of thinking as to his own powers, for he stayed here several days after he was ordered to the front. He must have known he could do no good, and I am of his opinion." 
When the wagon in which I was to travel to Flat Rock drove up to the door, covered with a tent-like white cloth, in my embarrassment for an opening in the conversation, I asked the driver's name. He showed great hesitation in giving it, but at last said, "'My name is Sherman,' adding, "'And now I see by your face that you won't go with me. My name is against me these times.' Here he grinned and remarked, "'But you would leave Lincolnton.' That name was the last drop in my cup, but I gave him Mrs. Glover's reason for staying here. General Johnston had told her this might be the safest place after all. He thinks the Yankees are making straight for Richmond and General Lee's rear, and will go by Camden and Lancaster, leaving Lincolnton on their west flank. The McLeans are kind people. They ask no rent for their rooms, only twenty dollars a week for firewood. Twenty dollars! And such dollars! Mere waste paper! Mrs. Monroe took up my photograph book, in which I have a picture of all the Yankee generals. "'I want to see the men who are to be our masters,' said she. "'Not mine,' I answered. "'Thank God, come what may. This was a free fight. We had as much right to fight to get out as they had to fight to keep us in. If they try to play the masters, anywhere upon the habitable globe will I go, never to see a Yankee, and if I die on the way, so much the better.' Then I sat down and wrote to my husband in language much worse than anything I can put in this book. As I wrote, I was blinded by tears of rage. Indeed, I nearly wept myself away. February 26th. Mrs. Monroe offered me religious books, which I declined, being already provided with the Lamentations of Jeremiah, the Psalms of David, the Denunciations of Hosea, and, above all, the Patient Wail of Job. Job is my comforter now. I should be so thankful to know life would never be any worse with me. My husband is well, and has been ordered to join the great retreater. I am bodily comfortable, if somewhat dingily lodged, and I daily part with my raiment for food. We find no one who will exchange eatables for confederate money, so we are devouring our clothes. Opportunities for social enjoyment are not wanting. Miss Middleton and Isabella often drink a cup of tea with me. One might search the whole world and not find two cleverer or more agreeable women. Miss Middleton is brilliant and accomplished. She must have been a hard student all her life. She knows everybody worth knowing, and she has been everywhere. Then she is so high-bred, high-hearted, pure and true. She is so clean-minded. She could not harbor a wrong thought. She is utterly unselfish, a devoted daughter and sister. She is one among the many large-brained women a kind providence has thrown in my way, such as Mrs. McCord, daughter of Judge Chevis, Mary Preston Darby, Mrs. Emery, granddaughter of old Franklin, the American wise man, and Mrs. Jefferson Davis. How I love to praise my friends! As a ray of artificial sunshine, Mrs. Monroe sent me an examiner. Daniel thinks we are at the last gasp, and now England and France are bound to step in. England must know if the United States of America are triumphant, they will tackle her next, and France must wonder if she will not have to give up Mexico. My faith fails me. It is all too late. No help for us now from God or man. Thomas, Daniel says, was now to ravage Georgia. But Sherman, from all accounts, has done that work once for all. There will be no aftermath. They say no living thing is found in Sherman's track only chimneys, like telegraph poles, to carry the news of Sherman's army backward. In all that tropical downpour, Mrs. Monroe sent me overshoes and an umbrella, with the message, Come over. I went, for it would be as well to drown in the streets as to hang myself at home to my own bedpost. At Mrs. Monroe's I met a Miss McDaniel. Her father, for seven years, was the Methodist preacher at our Negro church. The Negro church is in a grove just opposite Mulberry House. She says her father has so often described that fine old establishment and its beautiful lawn, live oaks, etc. Now, I dare say, there stand at Mulberry only Sherman sentinels, stacks of chimneys. We have made up our minds for the worst. Mulberry House is no doubt raised to the ground. Miss McDaniel was inclined to praise us. She said, as a general rule, the Episcopal minister went to the family mansion, and the Methodist missionary preached to the Negroes, and dined with the overseer at his house. 
but at Mulberry her father always stayed at the house, and the family were so kind and attentive to him. It was rather pleasant to hear one's family so spoken of among strangers. So, well equipped to brave the weather, armed cap a pie, so to speak, I continued my prowl farther afield and brought up at the Middletons. I may have surprised them, for, at such an inclement season, they hardly expected a visitor. Never, however, did lonely old woman receive such a warm and hearty welcome. Now we know the worst. Are we growing hardened? We avoid all allusion to Columbia. We never speak of home, and we begin to deride the certain poverty that lies ahead. How it pours! Could I live many days in solitary confinement? Things are beginning to be unbearable, but I must sit down and be satisfied. My husband is safe so far. Let me be thankful it is no worse with me. But there is the gnawing pain all the same. What is the good of being here at all? Our world has simply gone to destruction. And across the way the fair Lydia languishes. She has not even my resources against ennui. She has no Isabella, no Miss Middleton, two as brilliant women as any in Christendom. Oh, how does she stand it? I mean to go to church if it rains cats and dogs. My feet are wet two or three times a day. We never take cold. Our hearts are too hot within us for that. A carriage was driven up to the door as I was riding. I began to tie on my bonnet, and said to myself in the glass, Oh, you lucky woman! I was all in a tremble, so great was my haste to be out of this. Mrs. Glover had the carriage. She came for me to go and hear Mr. Martin preach. He lifts our spirits from this dull earth. He takes us up to heaven. That I will not deny. Still, he cannot hold my attention. My heart wanders, and my mind strays back to South Carolina. Oh, Vandal Sherman, what are you at there, hard-hearted wretch that you are? A letter from General Chestnut, who writes from camp near Charlotte under date of February 28th. I thank you a thousand, thousand times for your kind letters. They are now my only earthly comfort, except the hope that all is not yet lost. We have been driven like a wild herd from our country, and it is not from a want of spirit in the people or soldiers, nor from want of energy and competency in our commanders. The restoration of Joe Johnston, it is hoped, will redound to the advantage of our cause and the re-establishment of our fortunes. I am still in not very agreeable circumstances for the last four days completely water-bound. I am informed that a detachment of Yankees were sent from Liberty Hill to Camden with a view to destroying all the houses, mills, and provisions about that place. No particulars have reached me. You know I expected the worst that could be done, and am fully prepared for any report which may be made. It would be a happiness beyond expression to see you, even for an hour. I have heard nothing from my poor old father. I fear I shall never see him again. Such is the fate of war. I do not complain. I have deliberately chosen my lot, and am prepared for any fate that awaits me. My care is for you, and I trust still in the good cause of my country and the justice and mercy of God. It was a lively, rushing, young set that South Carolina put to the fore. They knew it was a time of imminent danger, and that the fight would be ten to one. They expected to win by activity, energy, and enthusiasm. Then came the wet blanket, the croakers. Now these are posing, wrapping Caesar's mantle about their heads to fall with dignity. Those gallant youths who dashed so gaily to the front lie mostly in bloody graves. Well for them, maybe. There are worse things than honorable graves. Wearisome thoughts. Late in life we are to begin anew, and have laborious, difficult days ahead. We have contradictory testimony. Governor Aiken has passed through, saying Sherman left Columbia as he found it, and was last heard from at Sherraw. Dr. Chisholm walked home with me. He says that is the last version of the story. Now, my husband wrote that he himself saw the fires which burned up Columbia. The first night his camp was near enough to the town for that. They say Sherman has burned Lancaster, that Sherman nightmare, that ghoul, that hyena. But I do not believe it. He takes his time. There are none to molest him. He does things leisurely and deliberately. 
Why stop to do so needless a thing as burn Lancaster Courthouse, the jail, and the tavern? As I remember it, that description covers Lancaster. A raiding party, they say, did for Camden. No train from Charlotte yesterday. Rumor says Sherman is in Charlotte. End of chapter 19, part 1nineteen part two of a diary from Dixie. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Laurie Ann Walden. A diary from Dixie by Mary Chestnut. Chapter nineteen Lincolnton, North Carolina, part two. February twenty ninth. Trying to brave it out. They have plenty, yet let our men freeze and starve in their prisons. Would you be willing to be as wicked as they are? A thousand times no. But we must feed our army first if we can do so much as that. Our captives need not starve if Lincoln would consent to exchange prisoners. But men are nothing to the United States, things to throw away. If they send our men back, they strengthen our army. And so, again, their policy is to keep everybody and everything here in order to help starve us out. That, too, is what Sherman's destruction means, to starve us out. Young Brevard asked me to play accompaniments for him. The guitar is my instrument, or was, so I sang and played to my own great delight. It was a distraction. Then I made eggnog for the soldier boys below, and came home. Have spent a very pleasant evening. Begone, dull care, you and I never agree. Ellen and I are shut up here. It is rain, rain, everlasting rain. As our money is worthless, are we not to starve? Heavens, how grateful I was today when Mrs. McLean sent me a piece of chicken. I think the emptiness of my larder has leaked out. Today Mrs. Monroe sent me hot cakes and eggs for my breakfast. March 5th. Is the sea drying up? Is it going up into mist and coming down on us in a water spout? The rain, it raineth every day. The weather typifies our tearful despair on a large scale. It is also Lent now. A quite convenient custom, for we, in truth, have nothing to eat. So we fast and pray, and go dragging to church like drowned rats to be preached at. My letter from my husband was so, well, what in a woman you would call heartbroken, that I began to get ready for a run up to Charlotte. My hat was on my head, my traveling bag in my hand, and Ellen was saying, Which umbrella, ma'am? Stop, Ellen, said I. Someone is speaking out there. A tap came at the door, and Miss McLean threw the door wide open as she said in a triumphant voice, "'Permit me to announce General Chestnut.' As she went off, she sang out, "'Oh, does not a meeting like this make amends?' We went after luncheon to see Mrs. Monroe. My husband wanted to thank her for all her kindness to me. I was awfully proud of him. I used to think that everybody had the air and manners of a gentleman." I know now that these accomplishments are things to thank God for. Father O'Connell came in, fresh from Columbia, and with news at last. Sherman's men had burned the convent. Mrs. Monroe had pinned her faith to Sherman because he was a Roman Catholic, but Father O'Connell was there and saw it. The nuns and girls marched to the old Hampton house, Mrs. Preston's now, and so saved it. They walked between files of soldiers. Men were rolling tar barrels and lighting torches to fling on the house when the nuns came. Columbia is but dust and ashes, burned to the ground. Men, women, and children have been left there homeless, houseless, and without one particle of food, reduced to picking up corn that was left by Sherman's horses on picket grounds and parching it to stay their hunger. How kind my friends were on this, my fate day! Mrs. Rutledge sent me a plate of biscuit. Mrs. Monroe, nearly enough food supplies for an entire dinner. Mrs. McLean, a cake for dessert. Ellen cooked and served up the material happily at hand, very nicely indeed. There never was a more successful dinner. My heart was too full to eat, but I was quiet and calm. At least I spared my husband the trial of a broken voice and tears. As he stood at the window, with his back to the room, he said, where are they now, my old blind father and my sister? Day and night I see her leading him out from under his own roof-tree. That picture pursues me persistently. But come, let us talk of pleasanter things. 
to which I answered, "'Where will you find them?' He took off his heavy cavalry boots, and Ellen carried them away to wash the mud off and dry them. She brought them back just as Miss Middleton walked in. In his agony, while struggling with those huge boots and trying to get them on, he spoke to her volubly in French. She turned away from him instantly as she saw his shoeless plight, and said to me, "'I had not heard of your happiness. I did not know the general was here.' Not until next day did we have time to remember and laugh at that outbreak of French. Miss Middleton answered him in the same language. He told her how charmed he was with my surroundings, and that he would go away with a much lighter heart since he had seen the kind people with whom he would leave me. I asked my husband what that correspondence between Sherman and Hampton meant, this while I was preparing something for our dinner. His back was still turned as he gazed out of the window. He spoke in the low and steady monotone that characterized our conversation the whole day, and yet there was something in his voice that thrilled me as he said, The second day after our march from Columbia we passed the M's. He was a bonded man and not at home. His wife said at first that she could not find forage for our horses, but afterwards she succeeded in procuring some. I noticed a very handsome girl who stood beside her as she spoke and I suggested to her mother the propriety of sending her out of the track of both armies. Things were no longer as heretofore. There was so much straggling, so many camp followers, with no discipline on the outskirts of the army. The girl answered quickly, I wish to stay with my mother. That very night a party of Wheeler's men came to our camp, and such a tale they told of what had been done at the place, of horror and destruction the mother left raving. The outrage had been committed before her very face, she having been secured first. After this crime the fiends moved on. There were only seven of them. They had been gone but a short time when Wheeler's men went in pursuit at full speed and overtook them, cut their throats, and wrote upon their breasts, these were the seven. But the girl? Oh, she was dead. Are his critics as violent as ever against the President? asked I, when recovered from pity and horror. Sometimes I think I'm the only friend he has in the world. At these dinners, which they give us everywhere, I spoil the sport, for I will not sit still and hear Jeff Davis abused for things he is no more responsible for than any man at that table. Once I lost my temper and told them it sounded like errant nonsense to me, and that Jeff Davis was a gentleman and a patriot with more brains than the assembled company. "'You lost your temper, truly,' said I. "'And I did not know it. "'I thought I was as cool as I am now. "'In Washington, when we left, "'Jeff Davis ranked second to none in intellect, "'and maybe first from the South, "'and Mrs. Davis was the friend of Mrs. Emery, "'Mrs. Joe Johnston, and Mrs. Montgomery Blair, "'and others of that circle. "'Now they rave that he is nobody and never was.' "'And she?' I asked. Oh, you would think to hear them that he found her yesterday in a Mississippi swamp. Well, in the French Revolution it was worse. When a man failed, he was guillotined. Mirabeau did not die a day too soon, even Mirabeau. He is gone. With despair in my heart, I left that railroad station. Alan Green walked home with me. I met his wife and his four ragged little boys a day or so ago. She is the neatest, the primmest, the softest of women. Her voice is like the gentle cooing of a dove. That lowering black future hangs there all the same. The end of the war brings no hope of peace or of security to us. Ellen said I had a little piece of bread and a little molasses in store for my dinner today. March 6. Today came a godsend. Even a small piece of bread and the molasses had become things of the past. My larder was empty when a tall mulatto woman brought a tray covered by a huge white serviette. Ellen ushered her in with a flourish, saying, Mrs. McDaniel's maid. The maid set down the tray upon my bare table and uncovered it with conscious pride. There were fowls ready for roasting, sausages, butter, bread, eggs, and preserves. I was dumb with delight. After silent thanks to heaven, my powers of speech returned, and I exhausted myself in messages of gratitude to Mrs. McDaniel. "'Mrs., you oughtn't to let her see how glad you was,' said Ellen. "'It was a letting of yourself down.' Mrs. Glover gave me some yarn, and I bought five dozen eggs with it from a wagon. 
eggs for lint. To show that I have faith yet in humanity, I paid in advance in yarn for something to eat, which they promised to bring tomorrow. Had they rated their eggs at one hundred dollars a dozen in Confederate money, I would have paid it as readily as ten dollars. But I haggle in yarn for the millionth part of a thread. Two weeks have passed, and the rumors from Columbia are still of the vaguest. No letter has come from there, no direct message or messenger. "'My God!' cried Dr. Frank Miles. "'But it is strange. Can it be anything so dreadful they dare not tell us?' Dr. San Julian Ravenel has grown pale and haggard with care. His wife and children were left there. Dr. Brumby has at last been coaxed into selling me enough leather for the making of a pair of shoes, else I should have had to give up walking. He knew my father well. He intimated that in some way my father helped him through college. His own money had not sufficed, and so William C. Preston and my father advanced funds sufficient to let him be graduated. Then my uncle, Charles Miller, married his aunt. I listened in rapture, for all this tended to leniency in the leather business, and I bore off the leather gladly. When asked for Confederate money in trade, I never stopped a bargain. I give them twenty dollars or fifty dollars cheerfully for anything, either sum. March 8th. Colonel Childs came with a letter from my husband and a newspaper containing a full account of Sherman's cold-blooded brutality in Columbia. Then we walked three miles to return the call of my benefactress, Mrs. McDaniel. They were kind and hospitable at her house, but my heart was like lead. My head ached, and my legs were worse than my head, and then I had a nervous chill. So I came home, went to bed, and stayed there, until the fence brought me a letter saying my husband would be here today. Then I got up and made ready to give him a cheerful reception. Soon a man called, Troy by name, the same who kept the little corner shop so near my house in Columbia, and of whom we bought things so often. We had fraternized. He now shook hands with me and looked in my face pitifully. We seem to have been friends all our lives. He says they stopped the fire at the Methodist College, perhaps to save old Mr. MacArthur's house. Mr. Sheriff Dent, being burned out, took refuge in our house. He contrived to find favor in Yankee eyes. Troy relates that a Yankee officer snatched a watch from Mrs. McCord's bosom. The soldiers tore the bundles of clothes that the poor wretches tried to save from their burning homes and dashed them back into the flames. They meant to make a clean sweep. They were howling round the fires like demons, these Yankees, in their joy and triumph at our destruction. Well, we have given them a big scare and kept them miserable for four years, the little handful of us. A woman we met on the street stopped to tell us a painful coincidence. A general was married, but he could not stay at home very long after the wedding. When his baby was born, they telegraphed him, and he sent back a rejoicing answer with an inquiry, Is it a boy or a girl? He was killed before he got the reply. Was it not sad? His poor young wife says, He did not live to hear that his son lived. The kind woman added sorrowfully, died, and did not know the sect of his child. "'Let us hope it will be a Methodist,' said Isabella, the irrepressible. At the venison feast, Isabella heard a good word for me, and one for General Chestnut's air of distinction, a thing people cannot give themselves, try as ever they may. Lord Byron says, "'Everybody knows a gentleman when he sees one, and nobody can tell what it is that makes a gentleman.' He knows the thing, but he can't describe it. Now, there are some French words that cannot be translated, and we all know the thing they mean. Gracieuse and svelte, for instance, as applied to a woman. Not that anything was said of me like that. Far from it. I am fair, fat, forty, and jolly, and in my unbroken jollity, as far as they know, they found my charm. You see, she doesn't howl, she doesn't cry, she never, never tells anybody about what she was used to at home and what she has lost. High praise, and I intend to try and deserve it ever after. March 10th. Went to church crying to Ellen, It is Lent, we must fast and pray. When I came home, my good fairy, Colonel Childs, had been here bringing rice and potatoes and promising flour. He is a trump. He pulled out his pocketbook and offered to be my banker. 
He stood there on the street, Miss Middleton and Isabella witnessing the generous action, and straight out offered me money. "'No, put up that,' said I. "'I am not a beggar, and I never will be. To die is so much easier.' Alas, after that flourish of trumpets, when he came with a sack of flour, I accepted it gratefully. I receive things I cannot pay for, but money is different. There I draw a line, imaginary, perhaps. Once before the same thing happened. Our letters of credit came slowly in 1845, when we went unexpectedly to Europe, and our letters were to follow us. I was a poor little inoffensive bride, and a British officer, who guessed our embarrassment, for we did not tell him, he came over with us on the ship, asked my husband to draw on his banker until the letters of credit should arrive. It was a nice thing for a stranger to do. We have never lost what we never had. We have never had any money, only unlimited credit, for my husband's richest kind of a father insured us all manner of credit. It was all a mirage only at last, and it has gone, just as we drew nigh to it. Colonel Child says eight of our senators are for Reconstruction, and that a ray of light has penetrated inward from Lincoln, who told Judge Campbell that Southern land would not be confiscated. March 12th. Better today. A long, long, weary day in grief has passed away. I suppose General Chestnut is somewhere. But where? That is the question. Only once has he visited this sad spot which holds, he says, all that he cares for on earth. Unless he comes or writes soon, I will cease, or try to cease, this wearisome looking, looking, looking for him. March 13th. My husband at last did come for a visit of two hours. Brought Lawrence, who had been to Camden, and was there, indeed, during the raid. My husband has been ordered to Chester, South Carolina. We are surprised to see by the papers that we behaved heroically in leaving everything we had to be destroyed without one thought of surrender. We had not thought of ourselves from the heroic point of view. Isaac McLaughlin hid and saved everything we trusted him with. A grateful negro is Isaac. March 15th. Lawrence says Miss Chestnut is very proud of the presence of mind and cool self-possession she showed in the face of the enemy. She lost, after all, only two bottles of champagne, two of her brother's gold-headed canes, and her brother's horses, including Claudia, the broodmare, that he valued beyond price, and her own carriage, and a flybrush boy called Battis, whose occupation in life was to stand behind the table with his peacock feathers and brush the flies away. He was the sole member of his dusky race at Mulberry who deserted all Master to follow the Yankees. Now for our losses at the Hermitage. Added to the gold-headed canes and Claudia, we lost every mule and horse, and President Davis's beautiful Arabian was captured. John's were there, too. My light dragoon, Johnny, and heavy swell, is stripped light enough for the fight now. Jonathan, whom we trusted, betrayed us, and the plantation and mills, Mulberry House, etc., were saved by Claiborne, that black rascal who was suspected by all the world. Claiborne boldly affirmed that Mr. Chestnut would not be hurt by destroying his place. The invaders would hurt only the Negroes. "'Mars Jeems,' said he, "'hardly ever come here, and he takes only a little something nut to eat when he do come.' Fever continuing, I sent for San Julian Ravenel. We had a wrangle over the slavery question. Then he fell foul of everybody who had not conducted this war according to his ideas." Ellen had something nice to offer him, thanks to the ever-bountiful child, but he was too angry, too anxious, too miserable to eat. He pitched into Ellen after he had disposed of me. Ellen stood glaring at him from the fireplace, her blue eye nearly white, her other eye blazing as a comet. Last Sunday he gave her some Dover's powders for me. Directions were written on the paper in which the medicine was wrapped, and he told her to show these to me, then to put what I should give her into a wine-glass and let me drink it. Ellen put it all into the wine-glass and let me drink it at one dose. "'It was enough to last you your lifetime,' he said. "'It was murder.' Turning to Ellen. "'What did you do with the directions?' "'I never see no directions. You never give me none.' "'I told you to show that paper to your mistress.' "'Well, I flung that old brown paper in the fire.' "'What you making all this fuss for? 
Soon as I give Mrs. de physic, she stop frettin' and flingin' bout. She go to sleep sweet as a sucklin' baby, and she slept two days and nights, and now she heap better. And Ellen withdrew from the controversy. Well, all is well that ends well, Mrs. Chestnut. You took opium enough to kill several persons. You were worried out and needed rest. You came near getting it thoroughly. You were in no danger from your disease, but your doctor and your nurse combined were deadly. Maybe I was saved by the adulteration, the feebleness of Confederate medicine. A letter from my husband, written at Chester Court House on March 15th, says, In the morning I send Lieutenant Ogden with Lawrence to Lincolnton to bring you down. I have three vacant rooms, one with bedsteads, chairs, washstands, basins, and pitchers, the two others bare. You can have half of a kitchen for your cooking. I have also at Dr. de Vega's a room, furnished, to which you are invited, board also. You can take your choice. If you can get your friends in Lincolnton to assume charge of your valuables, only bring such as you may need here. Perhaps it will be better to bring bed and bedding and the other indispensables. End of chapter 19